Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to CRIMA 2021. My name is Lita Miti Kamata. I am a partner at Adams and & Adams, and I am delighted to be hosting you. Before I say anything further, I need to inform you that this session is being recorded. And the recordings will be made available on our website, www.adams.africa. Before I, um, I carry on with the program, I also need to cover off one or two rules, um, one or two house rules. The cameras and microphones have been switched off. Um, that is to try and minimize disruption during the session. However, we do want to hear from you and we do want you to engage with our guest speakers today. So please um, drop your thoughts and your questions on the chat. For those of you not familiar with Teams, the chat um, is signified by that speech bubble at the top ribbon. So drop your um, questions. Um, please do not use the lift your hand function because the microphones have been switched off. Um, I also want to let you know that we will have a survey at the end of the session, so please stick around. We also would appreciate your feedback, um, what you think of CREMA, what we could improve on going forward. Now to carry on with the business of the day, uh, perhaps I should take a step back. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with CREMA or who haven't been able to join us on day one and two, uh, CREMA is our firm's annual event where we literally update you on the most topical legal happenings in our various practice areas. Uh, we do this by way of this type of session, of an informational morning session. Um, so throughout the day, you can, in fact, throughout the morning, you can expect to hear some presentations um, and hopefully interactive ones because we expect to hear from you. Um, just so you know, for Crammer Day 1, we kicked off looking at leadership in branding. We had some thought-provoking presentations from all our speakers. On Crammer Day 2, we took a closer look at leadership in business. And there we had a very interesting discussion regarding uh, mandatory vaccinations in the workplace. Um, I think that is definitely worth checking out. Um, we also had um, a really good presentation on insurance law, um, specifically covering the latest developments in that following the lootings that happened in South Africa um, not so long ago. Today, you can expect a jam-packed lineup. Uh, we were looking at leadership in innovation. I'm looking forward to hearing from um, all our speakers this morning. You can expect to hear um, about innovation and commercialization in the medical field. Um, you can expect to hear whether the courts have been innovating, how have hearings been conducted, um, particularly looking at legal disputes concerning patents and, and designs. Um, we will also then be hearing about the IP waiver. Uh, I'm sure you've seen or heard that term being thrown around. Hopefully one of the talks will give us um, insight as to what that is and how it practically applies or what it means for us in, in the South African context. So without further ado, I will carry on with the business of the day. I would like to introduce to you our first guest speaker, Dr. Emmanuel Taban. Um, I must say that when I was reading up on Dr. Taban, um, I thought, oh my goodness, what a remarkable, remarkable life. Um, he's made significant strides in medicine, really amazing contributions, particularly in some of the disadvantaged areas in our country. Um, I must say that I also felt extremely challenged. In fact, I thought to myself, what am I doing to change the world? And I hope his talk today will inspire you and challenge you. Um, when a nurse once told a young Emmanuel Taban that he'd grow up to become a doctor, he thought that was absurd. Um, the possibility of being able to survive beyond childhood was difficult to imagine, let alone being able to go to school. Today, Taban holds three medical degrees, I said three, um, and recently became qualified to offer expert pulmonology care at Mediclinic Highfelt a rare and valuable service in rural Bumalanga, as well as MediClinic Midstream. Pulmonology is a medical field that addresses diseases involving the respiratory tract. Apart from his groundbreaking medical achievements, his personal story of getting from war to South Sudan to where he is today will leave you speechless and overwhelmed. Certainly did that to me. Dr. Taban provides pro bono med primary health care services to patients in a local Secunda retirement home and assists with giving pulmon pulmonary function tests 
at a nearby provincial hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Emmanuel Taban. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Yes, my name is uh, Manuel Taban. And I really want to say thank you for inviting me to speak at annual intellectual property PREMA virtual event which is sponsored by Adam and Adam. I just want to tell you a bit about my background before I actually talk about innovation in medicine. As I sit, as I sit here today virtually, it's hard to believe that that as a father, husband, married to my beautiful wife, as one of the leading pharmacologists in the in the country, that once. I was a South Sudanese refugee street child. And at the same time, I'm the very the same person you see here today who have recently named, named as one of the 100 most influential Africans of 2020. Once had no shelter, no food, no family, and no future. As I sit now at my office at Medic Clinic Midstream corner office, I think back to the time in my life when I was destitute, a boy who spent many days and night alone on the road, in prisons, sleeping on the pavement without any idea where my next meal will come from. Even to me, the life that I live and the challenges that I have overcome compared to the life I live today sometimes feels unreal. Almost like a movie, to many of you, it may even seem unbelievable. I've recently been celebrated by medical fraternities and media across the world for innovation I have developed when treating critical ill COVID-19 patients using the therapeutic bronchoscopy. And so, despite all the television, radio interviews, and all the thoughts I've received of late, I can never forget where I come from. Before I reached the age of 18, I've been jailed five times. I've been beaten by strangers, tortured by soldiers, and I've even been rejected by those that I thought I could rely on, include members of my own family. I've spent more days and nights than I can remember on the street without food or roof over my head. Before I turned 18, I have walked close to 6,000 kilometers from my home country in South Sudan, to Eritrea, onto Tanzania, and to Mozambique until I finally landed up in South Africa in 1995, a month before I turned 18. The question is, what was driving me? What was I trying to escape from? And why was I so sad to get to South Africa? And actually, what make difference? What make me different from the rest of the Africans? Why did I become a leading pulmonologist? when I just qualified in 2007, 2008? These are some questions that I hope I will answer today. But like all good stories, let me start at the beginning. I was born on mud floor in Juba in South Sudan in 1977 into the world of poverty. When I say poverty, I really mean poverty. It was, I was the youngest of the four children raised by hardworking single mother. And because of her strength and goodness, my early years were happy despite the poverty and adversity all around me. That all seemed to be normal to me. I grew up in a village with no sanitation. We had have, we have to relieve ourselves from the fell, using leaves to clean ourselves. Toilet papers were luxury and well for the rich. We bought in nearby river, washed our clothes there, and for, more, for most people, we probably live in the Stone Age time. But honestly, most people in South Sudan and even South Africa still live in those conditions, if not even worse than the ones I was raised on. So, my first, let me just briefly highlight why I went to prison for the first time. In 1992, when I was about 14, turning 15, I started to work for a trader who lent me 
his bike and give me some money to buy bread for him to sell from his stall. Most people today in this room know that South Sudan is a country that has been engulfed in senseless war for numbers of years. And those times was the beginning of the war. And that time, my mother still barely managed to provide us for us and wanted to get more food as well as clothes and shoes. I felt very pleased with myself, of course, for identifying this business opportunity, for having the courage to pursue it and for being trustworthy, of course, enough for the trader to give me money in advance at the age of 14. I welcome, of course, this other responsibility as an opportunity to replace my father and trying to look after my mother. Just going back, my, my father, of course, divorced my mother six months before I was born. So for all intents and purposes, I was a fatherless child. And today in South Africa, 69% of the children are fatherless. And that's where are probably where is the origin of our poverty in this continent. Of course, during my business uh, ordeal, my downfall came because I couldn't bear to see people suffering, particularly my own relatives and friends. Instead of taking a share of the profit, I first took home some bread for myself and for my family. Then I give credit to some people because I knew how poor they were. But of course, they inevitably forget to pay me. It was also not possible for a young boy to cycle around the street carrying loaves of bread without attracting the attention of thieves. One day, three hungry men blocked my passage on the, on the road. In my innocency, I initially stopped because I assumed that they wanted to buy it from me, but they had no plans to pay and simply robbed me of my entire stock. When I reached the market empty-handed and, and told my tale of woe, the trader who was claiming I had been taken advantage of me, he demanded that I pay him back what I owe, and I promised I would. And of course, that time I was young and naive. I didn't tell my mother about what had happened, but rather I decided maybe the smartest thing was to pursue someone else to give me some money so that I could buy and sell bread for her. But of course I did. I was successful in convincing someone else to give me some money, and I did. And of course, the weakness that I used that money to pay back half of the money I owed the first trader. Now having two people going after me. I then, however, I have nothing to give to the woman and I couldn't pay the other trader full of course is what I owe him. And in South Sudan, we have no lawyers. We have no legal route, of course. Then I was taken to a ship and that was when I was sentenced to first in prison. And, and, and of course, that taught me quite a very valuable lesson in my life. And of course, one of the lessons was not to, to pay debts with debts. But of course, the war in South Sudan intensified to levels that was, you know, we, we depend on UN for food and for daily kind of, you know, like soap and all those. We become really, you know, poverty become deeper and deep. And, and that time, of course, then I also got arrested for the second time. Then, then I was in prison and then I decided to convert to Islam and I found myself in the north. And of course, why did I convert to Islam? I was trying to escape from my predicaments. And then in the north, of course, I tried to escape and then I found myself in Eritrea. And that was the beginning of my journey of purpose in South Africa. I don't know how many people in this room believe that, in, you know, a life is a journey and every journey actually must have a purpose. So all of us should be having purpose in our lives, you know, and, and, and all our journeys should be worthwhile. You need to define where were you going as an individual. And you have to define your purpose. And the day, the moment that you don't have purpose, that's probably the day that you, 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 you cease to live, you know, to, have, to, to become a human being. So I believe in life, you should have purpose in your journey. I want to discuss briefly, of course, the book is about 254 pages, but I want to highlight certain decisions that I made at the young age. When I was in Eritrea, of course, I was barely 16 years old. And I, I got thrown into prison for the second time now this time. And because I didn't have documentation or passport. And after being released in prison, I was sent to, to, to UN to take care of me. And the United Nations decided I should go to refugee camp for its, so that I can spend five years and they've been resettled after having legal documentation complete to be resettled to one of the first world country after three to four years. But something told me I was 16. I have no education. I barely have five years of schooling in my life. 
And I knew that if I go to the refugee camp, I become part of statistics of UN. It means I sit there helpless. I have to accept my circumstances that I will never get out of it. it means I wait for UN to support me and feed me. And with no education. And once I've probably been uh, turning 21, I could have been to America and I'll become one of the laborers in the market, probably working for McDonald's or cleaning the street or, or working the rubbish dump. And something told me that 16 that I need to take things to my own hand. So I rejected that offer and decided to choose to go on the street. And that was probably one of the biggest decisions in my life. And by doing that, I refuse to learn helplessness. What does that actually mean to refuse to helplessness? It means you find your sudden circumstance and you decide that there's nothing you can do to change your circumstance. So it means you accept anything that's thrown into you because you, you see the opportunity of changing your life has been difficult, has been impossible. And majority of us in Africa, we accepted that we are too helpless to change the regimes, to change our economic circumstances, and to change our businesses because we have reached the point COVID has hit us so badly. Because of the COVID, I cannot do one, two, three. But, and that's not true because that's basically what COVID does saying, you can do it, but you must get out of your comfort zone. And that's what's really, at that time, was that I refused to learn helplessness. And I say, I'd rather go in the street. Yes, it's going to be cold. I will not have shelter. I will not have food. But you know what? As long as I'm putting one step going forward, I will change my circumstances. And that was what, what I learned at that time. And second thing, of course, is that I choose a harder road instead of dependency. Going to UN, UN, UN refugee camp means you end dependent on people to support you instead of you actually taking your life in your own hand. And there's a reason why we're human. We should be more creating opportunity rather than taking opportunity and, de and being dependent on other people. And, and of course, the third thing at the age of 16 was, for me, I learned to trust in my own instinct because human beings can disappoint you. And that's what had happened that time. And of course, the second lesson that I learned in my life, of course, was that when I managed to leave Eritrea and make a difficult journey to Kenya. And one of the things that when I tried to cross to Kenya, I was turning 17, I got arrested by corrupt Kenya policemen. And I was thrown in prison. I remember I have to dress and undress naked in front of publics and I was beaten up, you know, and it was humiliating. And I lost all my money and all my belonging. And then I was thrown to Eritrea border. And of course, certain things happen there because my plan was to go to Kenya and get education, meet some of my relatives. But now I've lost everything. I couldn't communicate with my relatives in Kenya. I was thrown to Eritrea and have nothing. So one thing happens there. First thing I recognize that when you are in danger of starving, your immediate priority must change. And that time I switch my journey looking for education into survival mode. So the first thing what I did was to, to get a work as a clean and restaurant so that I can feed myself, humble myself, and of course, I worked my way and then I changed my destiny, de de destination. Instead of going to Kenya, I decided I was going to go back to Eritrea. So I made my way, of course, to, to Eritrea. And then, of course, one of the things that I learned there was trying to fail than fail to try. So I decided to take certain steps that were very unpopular. And of course, but one thing which probably is different from the rest of that people was honesty. I knew that if you're honest, you will get a lot of benefit of doubt than when people perce perceive you as being dishonest. So I always want to stay honest. If I'm hungry, I'd rather stay hungry than steal, than rob someone else. And that probably what probably make me who I am today. Today, most people would choose easy way to make more money, either in corruptible way or in other means, so that they can get a success very quickly. But that will catch up with you. And I always refuse that. I choose honest over other things. 
And of course, when I went to, to Ethiopia this time, Ethiopia was a town where everybody was poorer. And then I got stuck. Then I spent almost six weeks as a street child. And there were a lot of other street people, of course, in the town. We all sleep in the pavement. They're all begging. Some were robbing. Some were snipping blues. And I remember one journalist once asked me, but you were a street child. What differentiates you from the rest of the others? It's just like I could ask you today, what makes Adam a Adam best intellectual property company as compared to the others? And my answer that time was that those other street people, they have arrived. They arrived toward their journey. So they, have, they are going nowhere. But I was a child that was still in journey. I was still going somewhere. But we all know during our journeys, we can't get stuck. We can't face hardship. But the most important thing was never ever to give up. So for me today, I want you to remember one thing. Life is a journey. And every journey needs purpose. And if you have that, no matter how many circumstances you face, no matter how many hardships you face, you will overcome it as long you set your goal into a journey of purpose. But of course, one of the things that I learned there was that during that time as a street child in Addis Ababa, I, had, I was a Christian, I have a Bible, I have prayed, I hope for miracles. And the more I pray, the more poorer I become. I, and I reach one point in my life. And after today, I know one principle, God only work when you go work. And then I decide taking step to take control over my own life. And that probably would help me. And of course, I learned that sometimes help sometimes come from strangers, from people you don't know. So, and of course, my, as a street child, I knew that dignity was luxury when you had lost everything. But at that time also, I have nothing to lose because I was in the bottom. So, and of course, something also taught me there that failure was not final until you make it final. So most of us, we fail because we accepted to fail. But if we take that failure as a mistake, then we can correct our mistakes. And when you correct that mistake, you can change that failure to success. And that's what I did. And of course, during that struggle at Addis Ababa, I find a stranger and, and because of my determination, I was able to go back to Eletria. And guess what? When I landed up in Eletria, within five days, some good Samaritan come to me through the Catholic Church and offer me $500. And I make another trip this time with no problem up to Kenya. But ask yourself, I was in Kenya, gone thrown back, humiliated, become a street child for six weeks, and go back to Eletria. Now I find some help with a lot of money. If something somehow was trying to teach me hardship about life. So do I regret that journey that has failed? No, I make the best out of it. It taught me so many things that sometimes I need to fail for me to succeed in life. And that's what that happens. And of course, when I did my second trip to Kenya, I was successful because I had enough money. I, could, I bought a pa passport that belonged to someone else and I traveled to Kenya. And of course, I landed at my uncle's house. And guess what? Life was great. You give, I get food, nice to eat. I thought I have family. He shouldn't go to school. And three days later, I was asked, what's my plan? And remember the UN, I knew that he wanted me out of the house. And immediately I just told him, you know what? After having a can of Coca-Cola, I decided it was made in South Africa. And when he said I must go to refugee camp, I look at him, I said, no, I'm actually was going to South Africa. And he asked me when, I said today, not even tomorrow, because I wanted to get out of his house. I want to go back to the street. I want to start a journey and I want to define who I am. I want to stand out from the rest of the crowd. I don't want to be part of the crowd because if you're part of the crowd, you are not visible to the rest of the world. And then I took that trip. And one thing, of course, is that people today ask me, why aren't you angry with, with your uncle? You know what? I will never be angry with them because they rejected me. But that rejection was redirection to my path. 
And that rejection is what made me who I am today. And of course, did I have a head toward my uncle? No. Of course, if you had people, if you had the place, if you had the country, you would start everything become negative in your life. And that hatred that you have inside you is actually destroy you, not the people you hate. The people you hate will carry on with their life as normal as possible because they don't have issues with you. They're already done with you, but inside you haven't freed them. And that will prevent you from thinking freely. That will prevent you from becoming who you want to become. Because every time you see them, you become angry. And then emotional, emotional hatred consumes you. And your progress in life get retarded backward. How many of us in this country are stuck on the past instead of actually move forward and use all the injustice of past to provide us to other things? How many of us actually take our competitors as a, as a people that, that, that are against them, instead of actually looking at your competitors and say, why are they successful? How can I beat them in their own race and become better human beings? And that's what happens. So I, I really, really love my uncle after today. Then of course, when I took my trip from Kenya to South Africa, very few things happened. One of us was when I was in, uh, I arrived almost 200 kilometers uh, to, to the border of, uh, of Mozambique to South Africa by a commodity port. And I saw there were so many people from Eritrea, Ethiopia, all of them crossing to South Africa. And I saw, I said, my Lord, we are about 200 of us want to sneak through the border. And I said, my chances was going to be slim. So I asked, where's the next border? Then they say it's Bell Bridge. And that was about 200, 2,000 kilometers. So instead of taking 200 kilometers, I decided to take 2,000 kilometers. So sometimes in life, we should not be a follower. We should take and shut up road when nobody wants to go because you never know where the treasures lie. And of course, that time, I re and of course, people must resist us to remain in comfort zone where there is no growth. If you cannot grow, please get out of there because life, you must always grow. And I always that time, I saw problems as a challenge rather than a barrier to success. And of course, one thing told me that a view from mountain top is clearer than its food. And that's what today I enjoy. Then of course, when I arrived to South Africa, I spent some few years, as a few months as a street child. And then I got assisted by Komboni. And I, of course, as I mentioned that I only got five years of school in total. And I got opportunity to go to, to, to school. And of course, I passed my metric by that time with, the, with the about 57%. And I was supposed to do electrical engineering, but I knew that my strength did not lie in technical work. I was meant to be a doctor because inside me, I knew that. And I didn't want to settle for something that, that would just make me get food, food in the table. I want to do something based on passion. And then I decide I want to repeat my trick. But there were a lot of obstacles. I was already 20 years old. And I already have my trick certificate, which I passed by low marks. And I was a foreigner. I had no money. But guess what? I went to the school, JPI School for Boys. Everybody only allowed there by age of 17, grade 8. They never take people who repeat my tricks. They don't take foreigners because there are a lot of South African students in need. They want the people with money. And you have to be less than, of course, my age, 20 years old. You're like a grandfather in the class. But my courage, I went there and I got into the system. So sometimes we perceive that things are impossible. We will not be accepted. And most of them based on our perception. So sometimes we have to take that as shattered route. And of course, JP High School, despite all the, all the no no's no's, I took all the notes box, but the deputy headmaster decide to turn all the negative boxes into yes, 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 yes. And it allowed me to repeat my trick. And that was my biggest break in my life to go to university. But of course, being a dad matric has been 20 year old when you see me 17 year old. I have to humble myself because I needed that matric certificate for better tomorrow. So I didn't need to look at them saying you are young and I feel old. No, I humble myself 
except that I was older than them, but I knew why I was repeating the trick. And of course, one other thing, of course, that that lesson told me was that the fact that the door is closed does not mean you cannot push it gently or see through the keyhole. And that was the most important thing. Of course, when I finished my trick, I went to medical school, finished six years of medical school, which was awesome. And then I knew that probably I needed more knowledge. And I went to do internal medicine, University of Pretoria for four years. And I went to work at Hypermedic Clinic. When I went there, I faced different kind of challenges, which is most of the corporates today face. I went and I found a physician who'd been there for 14 years and he owed the place. He'd been there for long and everybody that came there, he managed to chase away. And when I came, he was in the process of kicking me out. And I remember he made my life hell. And I packed my bags and I want to leave. But somebody told me, go and, and pursue or, or advice. So I went to my guardian, who was a Bishop Whitbank, Bishop Sandry, and asked him about what I've gone through and the fact that I wanted to move out because of this person that managed is try to destroy my business. So he looks at me and he smiles and he says, come down with me, let's go and watch some TV. And I join him and he start horse raising. Then of course, horse number nine win. Then I say, wow, did you bet on that horse? He said, no, I don't do gambling. So, okay, great. That's awesome. Then say, no, watch again. What did you see? I said, horse number nine win. Then say, no, watch again. And then he reminded me some painful truth. He said, look at the horse number nine. It was running its own race. He doesn't look at left or right which horse was going to catch him, but he keep running, running until he wins. Or if that horse come out last, he's not going to look back saying, I was last. It's going to improve his performance next, next time. How many of us are focusing our energy on our competitors? instead of actually running our own race and become the best in who we are. So, and since that time, I went back strong and started running my own race. And I become the top admitting physician for three years and three years in a row for Medi Clinic South Africa in total for three years. And the gentleman who wanna kick me out, he become the second best to me. It's because I choose excellency to define me but not looking after him. I ignore him and I focus on my own rest. So self-development is very, very important and that can make you stand out, of course. And, and the, the opportunity for self-development is an individual responsibility that rests on you. You, it, you owe it to yourself to develop yourself academically to your full potentially. And secondly, and that remains as your choice. And of course, one of the things that I learned that for every mistake we made, there's a lesson to be learned. And you only see opportunity when your mind is fully developed. And most people today knew me very well about, um, today as uh, you know, people get to know me about the, the innovation I developed during COVID-19. And people ask me, wow, how do you come with that idea? You know, for me, it was not something major. For, for everybody say, out there, it's something big. But let me remind you very few simple principles of innovation. Most of the ideas for innovation is already on your fingertip. But innovation is only possible when you master your basics. When you master your basics. So your basic principle must be right before you innovate. What does that mean? How can you innovate when you're hungry? First, you must get food in the table. Maybe you must get clothes. Maybe you must get a pen and all this, have an office before you innovate. So for me, my innovation there was to become the best doctor as an intensivist, as a pulmonologist. And when COVID-19 came, I spent time studying about COVID-19 because I knew that Every doctor in South Africa were waiting for the literature coming from Europe, China, and America. But one thing we forget that people in China 
Europe and America. We're waiting for literature coming from us. So we see them as overseas, they see us overseas. So we need to meet them halfway. Our education system wasn't inferior to European, Chinese or to America. In fact, we are actually more superior because most of the people that qualify in South Africa end up in most of those countries without any problems. And I needed to master my basics. So I focus on my basic principle. So when you master your basics, of course, that innovation comes as a result of it because I knew all my basic, my ICU, I look at all the things, why are my patients dying? And after mastering every small thing from electrolytes to ventilator and everything, and there was nothing else that could explain why people with COVID-19 would have to die because of lung fibrosis at day seven. And that's when I took that step to do bronchoscopy because now I was innovating. I wanted to bolster their lung and maybe tell the world that, look, that fibrosis you're talking about is not real. And indeed, when I did that bronchoscopy, it was purely a mucus plug, nothing more. I'm not saying everybody with COVID-19 would develop mucus plug, but at least one out of 10 would develop mucus plug, and majority of pe these people will die. And I remember the recent a new article come from the European Respiratory Journal of Respiration actually saying that those patients in Europe who have mucus plug, most of them actually is a risk of death. Yes, I agree with them. But in South Africa, we took them out, they survived. So that's really all about innovation. Okay, so innovation is only possible when you master your basic. So if you are not good at what you're doing now, chances are good that you will not innovate. You might not become good who you are. So please be excellent at your basic principles now. Be the best where you are now, because then your mind will work at more higher level and you start seeing much more differently. So I have three pillars of success in my life that most people Always. For me, I learned one thing. For you, never choose a career because of money. Never change your work duty because of money. Chase, change your partner, choose a partnership because of passion. And passion is one thing that drives me. But sometimes being passionate is never good enough. Sometimes we do face difficulties. And when we face difficulties, we need to be determined to overcome those difficulties. And when you have overcome those di difficulties, of course, you want to make sure you produce the same result day in and day out. That's where it needs to be consistent. So I learned in medical field, I need to have three principles for me to be successful that I developed when I was at university level, passion, determination, and consistent. And that's probably what defined me the best out of me. Of course, recently I also published a book and which is doing extremely very well. So for me, Innovation is only possible when you master your basics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taban. Oh my goodness. I think I'm not the only person in the room who is like, what is wrong with you, Lita? Why aren't you, why are you making excuses? Um, your talk has just been so inspiring. I love a couple of things that you said. Um, right at the beginning, you said we must not pay debt with debt. I think that's an important principle. You also said that we must run our own race. Um, I think in the world we live in, it's so easy to be always looking next door, what they're doing, what they've got better and trying to, to, to compete and measure up to one another instead of focusing inward, uh, what we have, our gifts, our talents, and using those um, to serve our communities. Um, you also said that it's important to develop oneself. It is actually a choice that we have. I love that. Um, and that there's a lesson in every mistake um, that is very important. I think we become so engrossed in, in the mistake itself that we don't see the lesson that comes with it. Um, and I think my ex absolute favorite in all that you said is that you must master the basics so that you're able to innovate. Um, I think we have a couple of comments or one or two comments and questions. And um, before we hop on to those, I have a question. Um, you spoke a lot about purpose at the beginning of, of your talk. Um, I want to know, how does one recognize one's purpose? Well, you see, as a human beings, we are creatures that actually supposed to be having purpose. You know, like I remember when I left South Sudan, my purpose was to find education. 
And why education? Because I knew that if I have education, I could be able to explain so many things and develop myself to full potential. So now, you as a lawyer, let's say you become a lawyer, you need to ask yourself, what's your purpose as a lawyer? Are you there just to, to, to work? Or, I, or you want to actually to add value on and make a difference out of it? So, so means for you to recognize that purpose, you need to allow your passion and most of the time when you're passionate, that passion will lead you toward your purpose. So I use my passion to lead me to my purpose. So for you to recognize your purpose, it's not like you're waking up to say, oh my God, my purpose is to worship to the Lord. No, it's not that. <laughs> Ask yourself, what is my passion? If you've got a passion, then use that passion. And that passion will lead you, lead you blindly to your purpose. And I think for me, that's what each and every one of us should have passion in what they're doing. And then that will lead you to your purpose. And you'll find certain kind of fulfillment in you. That's good. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, we've got a question from Lindy. Um, she wants to know how effective are our current vaccines? And when in our medical, when in your medical opinion, will South Africa have the pandemic under control? I think that the vaccines, especially the Pfizer and Pfizer vaccine, is very effective. Why I say that, it's just based on the experience. I haven't seen anybody who have a uh, dual vaccine of Pfizer that end up in ICU. Okay. Only you see once in a while that actually end up in ICU. With Johnson & Johnson, I think probably we need a booster on Johnson & Johnson because we can't see a number of people after six months with Johnson & Johnson end up in ICU. Okay, but they, again, mortality is lower. They're the end, not ending and dying. Okay, so Johnson Johnson Pro, we need booster on that. So vaccines, yes, they're very effective. And recently, that just come out from France. Everybody in, in Paris does not wear a mask. Everybody in Switzerland does not wear a mask. So that means different, the, the vaccines are affected. So everybody should be, be, be kind of vaccinated. The problem in South Africa, I think, we have a lot of people who are anti-vaccine and our roll out of vaccines has been slower, but I know that it has picked up. And sooner we get more than 60% of population vaccinated then I think probably we will escape the fourth wave. Okay, thank you so much, Doc. I think we have time for one more. Um, just a, a short one. You faced a lot of adversity in your life. I mean, as a 14-year-old, being thrown in jail twice, I think I would have given up the second time. Um, I want to know, how did you keep the fire alive? How did you keep that fire alive? Um, you know, any sort of one or two tips because um, I'm sure a lot of us have faced adversity just now coming out um, of COVID, which is still very much um, among us. How do you keep that fire alive? You must ask yourself, why did you end up with those adversity? Imagine if life is a smooth selling, mm. then the world never going to be like this. That's why most countries will not have innovated. Those challenges are there to teach us a lesson. And you will see that when you face a challenge, and you decide to overcome it, you find that you step away from where you are to a better place. And you find that actually you become better than people who haven't faced those challenges. So, so sometimes the, the worst thing for us in Africa was we always look at those challenges and you mm. become victims. And when you become a victim, you become helpless. You know, I'll tell you circumstances like in South Sudan. Everybody is poor because of the war. And everybody's afraid of the president because he's a dictator and you, you, you know that if you go on the street, he's going to kill you. Then what happened that you end up accepting the circumstance that, you, look, I cannot do anything for myself. And the reality is that you could actually do something for yourself. You could be able to come out of it. And those hurdles that are put there, they're put there because they always say God will not put a task on you that when, when you know that you won't be able to overcome it. And sometimes we find that actually when there's the difficulties and you turn away, you never grow. Mm. And there's one thing that I wanted everybody in this room to know. If you go and you find that the door is closed, somebody in this room might actually see it as being half open and actually open it. And what basically does that mean? Don't see difficulties, failures as a challenges. You must celebrate it. When you're having problems at work, look at it saying, okay, 
this person doesn't like me. Why? What did I do wrong? Don't look in the context of that person. Why that person doesn't like me? You, that will not actually help you. Mm. Because I cannot change how you think about me, but I can change the way how I think about you. And if I think about you positively, chances are good that you might end changing your mind. So yes, in my life, yes, I faced a lot of hurdles, but something told me that whenever I overcome them, I become better. That's why up to today, I really enjoy difficult challenges. I enjoy failures because whenever I never take a failure as final because I don't believe that people can learn from their failures. Because indeed, if people learn from their failures, guess what? Africa was supposed to be one of the best developed continent because we are failing everything. But the reality is that you should not allow failure to define you. Take that failure as a mistake and correct it. And you will, you will never feel a victim again because excellency is the only way. So I always, if you gonna put a block at me, I promise you, I will always want to find a hole or drill a hole through that block to prove you wrong so that I can pass through and go to the other side, look where I am. So people must not look at, they shouldn't look at failure saying it's a, it's a final. No, it's there for a reason. Please skip over that failure and make it, make lemonade out of it. That is so awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Tavang. That was inspiring. Um, I think all of us feel like we can do one more thing. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, and now moving on to the next item on our agenda, we're going to hear about leadership in commercialization. Um, this talk will be given to us by Carl Baumeister. Carl has a master's in biochemistry and is an MBA candidate at the Gordon Institute of Business Science. He is a co-inventor of a number of patents and an entrepreneur. He co-founded an R&D startup and currently works towards building a world without TB by commercializing a novel medical diagnostic. He has a passion for design, strategy, problem solving and invention. Carl, thanks so much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you so much, Lita. Good morning, fellow colleagues. Along my eight year journey in an R&D startup, I have come to learn a few things I thought I'd share with you. Today, I wish to tell you an idea about ideas. I start with a passage written more than 120 years ago from the Journal of American Folklore. Today, man is monarch of cold and heat. Lord of winter snow and summer rain. The winds are his servants and lightning his messenger. Night is turned into day. The very mountains are removed and sea becomes dry land. The forms and features of those he has admired and loved remain to glad his eyes long after their bodies have crumbled to dust. Their very actions and motions he can view again, their very voices he can hear once more when and where he wills. Chamberlain, 1897. But what has made mankind such a master, I hear you ask? Not ideas, but rather ideas translated into reality. Come with me as I wind back the clock and look at some of these ideas. Here we see the human technological journey from the stone, bronze and iron ages all the way to the industrial and information ages. First, we transformed material, then energy, and now we transform information. But what does this mean for you and me? Well, perhaps one thing is that we don't need to grow our own food. Over the ages, we have gone from nearly everyone needing to make food to hardly anyone needing to make food. During the 1800s, 
we see a rapid decline in the labor force participating in agriculture. We went from sticks to plows to tractors and more recently AI powered harvesters that know where they are, where they need to go and what they need to do. These ideas are likely the reason why you and I have the freedom to pursue a broad range of careers from business to law to academia and even the arts. These days, our food literally comes to us at the touch of a button. If we zoom out even further, we get something like this. In the early ages, we invented using natural materials and craftsmanship with ceramics, metals and metallurgy. This was around the time of the Dark Ages and the Renaissance. It would seem as if something happened around the 18th century that correlates with an explosion of realized ideas. We have the light bulb, the electric car, which wasn't invented by Elon Musk, but was invented in the 1900s. And polymers and the lunar lander. We entered then the biological revolution. We get all kinds of amazing things like COVID-19 vaccines and recombinant insulin. We moved through this path from a chemical age to the plastic and nuclear age to the materials and biotechnology ages and the information and nanotechnology ages. Now we can cut and edit DNA wherever and however we want to with the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And perhaps in the future, we will have fusion energy to solve many of our challenges. If I think of my grandmother, who turned 90 this year and the life that she has lived. She has survived the Great Depression. And World War II. During her life, she has experienced the invention of radar, the atomic bomb, arguably not mankind's greatest invention, the ballpoint pen, the discovery of DNA, penicillin, the pacemaker, the microchip, the microwave oven, the moon landing, the personal computer, internet, GPS, the smartphone, and more recently, space travel. We can only dream that all of us will participate in space travel one day. But I postulate that the US Patent Act of 1790 was an instrumental turning point in promoting ideas and idea generation. Let me tell you a little bit about TB. Tuberculosis has been around for thousands of years. They've even found it in the bones of Egyptian mummies. Somehow, with all this technological advancement, TB remains a global problem, killing one and a half million people each year. That's more than all the road, air and maritime deaths combined. Yet the world has been testing for TB the same way for the past 100 years. Patients cough up a lung mucus sample, which is sent to a lab for testing and the results can take up to six weeks before the patient has a diagnosis. Then the patient typically goes home using public transport and infects everyone on their journey and everyone at home. I ask myself, how can it be that with all this technology, we are still grappling with an ancient disease? On the back of many years of scientific research, we have patented a new diagnostic method that uses a single drop of blood that can give a result in minutes. I wish I could say that our journey looked something like this. It seems so simple, 
you have an idea, you create an invention, you file a patent, you write a business plan, you put a team together. We happen to enter a business plan competition and, you know, raise some funding. Then you've got some more development work. You work with the medical doctors to collect the samples and international partners for your electronics and development. You generate some data and maybe you need to raise more capital before you can make your first sale break even and perhaps have an IPO. But ultimately, the goal is to save lives. It actually looks a little more like this with numerous iterative cycles along our journey. But if you asked me if I would do it all over again, my answer is a resounding yes. Whenever we present our business case to investors, one of the questions we are asked is about patents. It is a key criterion. In the history of our startup, no investor has been willing to part with their money and take a risk if they can't protect their investment. Part of our journey has been working with patent attorneys. Charlene and I can tell you stories of how skilled examiners with PhDs in patent offices around the world have grappled with understanding our ideas in nanotechnology and electrochemistry. Taking the time to craft precisely worded explanations and illustrations have frequently proven invaluable to the grant of our patents in numerous countries. In the case of our own inventions, we rely heavily on a symbiotic relationship between entrepreneur, scientist, doctor, engineer, and patent attorney. We do this to achieve meaningful IP protection, which enables a win-win as business, as we build business, advance knowledge, and save lives. Today I've mentioned some inventions that make life a little more convenient or have saved lives. But many life-saving ideas aren't translated into reality because too few are willing to take the leap and start something. We've all heard the adage, be the change you want to see in the world. But I say, Create the change you want to see in the world. Your ideas will probably outlive you and help more people than we could ever imagine. I leave you with the sustainable development goals. They will shape the future of our planet, our people, and our purpose. You and I are the solution to the world's challenges. We can realize ideas never seen before. Which of the goals will you pursue? Thank you. Thanks very much, Carl. That was, that gave me food for thought. Um, just the way you started, the talk, um, taking it all the way back. Um, I think the highlight for me is really your 90 year old grandmother who has lived through all of these inventions. Um, I hope that I will certainly live to be at that age and tell my kids about things that as, as already they can't believe that the TV had like a back part. You know, they think flat screens were always flat screens. Um, but you said something really powerful. Um, you said that something happens when ideas um, are realized. Um, and I think, you know, we can agree that in those ideas is valuable intellectual property. Um, you mentioned something about working with patent attorneys quite closely to realize those ideas so that you are able to persuade um, funders um, to come on board. Um, I'm just curious, are there any other forms of intellectual property um, that you rely on or, you know, that you use to assist you to kind of build that uh, IP bank within your business? 
Yes, so at this stage, um, most things are actually patents because it's it's heavily technological. So the the combination of your biochemistry and chemistry and engineering and microfluidics and nanotechnology and software and programming and all of these things combined, our, our key protection is actually an IP. Um, of course, there are other things which aren't necessarily in the patents from procedures and things that we continuously continuously develop. I'm pretty sure there's a little bit of, of um, brand insight or, or brand value and and something in, in, for example, logos and websites and things. Um, but at this time, because we are a startup, we've actually focused on the IP and that's that's where we find the, there's the most value to our investors and to actually unlocking the value to, to make it happen. But as well, um, when you start uh, uh, to construct a database and a data bank, the, the data is actually the valuable thing that gives you justification to say, actually, WHO or the FDA, you know, have a look at my test. Um, tell me what you think about it. Does it meet, um, you know, the sensitivity and specificity requirements? So data, I would say it would be. I love that. Thanks, Carl. Thanks very much. We've got a comment from Charlene. Well done, Carl. It has been a journey. Can you give us some insight into how your startup managed to enter the overseas company or how do you plan to do that? Or the overseas market, perhaps, or how do you plan to do that? Yeah, so uh, I say that we are actually, you know, still a developing startup. Um, we have networked internationally with a few organizations and foundations um, to gather new information to understand the requirements. You know, what are the specifications for a test that could be used globally? Um, TB is a massive problem in South Africa, but it is also a massive problem uh, uh, globally. Um, there's different kinds of TB. Um, so we, we've networked with a few organizations that um, provide significant guidance in, for example, uh, product profiles. So what is the ideal TB diagnostic? And those same companies that have already implemented advances into the current TB diagnostic market. Um, we have used numerous international partners. So when the technology wasn't available in South Africa, we literally scanned the globe and looked for people who could work in things like microfluidics and microelectronics to the to the level of accuracy that that we needed and that actually proved extremely important in our development part thanks very much carl i like that answer if there's nothing inside you look on the outside no excuses um, I think it just ties in so nicely with what Dr. Taban shared earlier today. Carl, thank you so very much um, for that talk. Um, we will now move on to the next item on our agenda. Thank you, Carl. Um, we will now hop over to the courts. Um, we want to understand what have they been doing? Have they been innovating during these COVID uncertain times? Um, the next um, guest, or not guest speaker, actually my partner, Dani Doman, will be presenting this talk. Um, Dani is a partner um, at Adams & Adams in the patent and litigation section. He specializes in patent, design, plant breeders' rights and intellectual property agreement litigation. Um, he also specializes in commercialization, um, in other words, making IP make you money and opinion work. Um, Danny has a number of has for a number of consecutive years been ranked in tier one for patent litigation in South Africa. So he's like that top, 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 top. Um, yeah, so that is Danny. Danny is going to take us through to see what the courts have been doing in terms of innovation um, when considering design and patent uh, disputes. Danny, are you there? Hi, Lita. Good, Good to morning. see you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Awesome. Over to you. Morning, everybody. Um, I've shared my screen and I just want to check that it is that my presentation is running. Um, yeah, we've had quite inspirational talks from uh, Dr. Tabang and from Carl. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we're now going to more, the more mundane or boring lawyering stuff. So I'll try to be quick. Um, we want to touch on 
three main aspects, some recent um, uh, things on the court system, um, what has happened and, and what is good and what has improved, then some points on patent enforcement and then some points on design enforcement. So firstly, what we have seen in the last two years on the patent enforcement and design enforcement side are the introduction of case lines into the Pretoria and Johannesburg High Court. Uh, it happened, um, it was a, on an experimental basis pre-COVID, but with COVID, it immediately got accelerated and it allows us to file, process and view all our legal documents in an electronic um, file. Um, it made life a lot easier for us lawyers. It uh, has got huge benefits, um, delays in getting uh, documents processed, um, distributing documents, all those things are taken away and the system has been extremely robust it's um, and it's made a huge difference in our ability to do run, run cases. Patent cases are before the Court of the Commission of Patents. So the registrar is at the uh, patents office. But as soon as a matter moves towards um, court hearings, we can use case lines in the High Court and um, run the matter electronically. And that has really facilitated the next one, which was virtual hearings. We've um, had a number of virtual trials with parties in different places. Those uh, ran extremely well, um, which are, and a lot of savings were achieved uh, because you don't need to fly experts around. Um, you um, avoid uh, accommodation costs, getting everybody to court. And the normal delays that court proceedings have, the virtual hearings have been uh, quite punctual uh, and, and very uh, time efficient. Um, we've had the trials, as we said, um, we've also had a number of arguments uh, on application, all of them uh, virtually. And um, it's been actually a pleasure working um, with those hearings and the, the courts and with case law. So over the last two years, I've, I would say that there's been great strides in getting our matters heard and the efficiency with which matters are being heard has improved. Over to patent enforcement, what we have seen, um, one of the nice cases that we dealt with over the last year was a security for cost case. And um, it's something that hasn't come up um, previously in South Africa, but it's something that's well known in foreign jurisdictions in the US and in Europe where we have what we call a non-practicing entity. Entity filing patents, they're not using the technology. The technology is just a paper-based idea and they lay in wait until a big corporate comes along, which arguably infringes the patent and the patentee or the, the corporation is then sued. And in essence, the aim is to extort money somehow from the corporation, either through just a payoff to use the uh, alleged invention or to um, get some license fees. So non-practicing uh, entities are sometimes also referred to as patent trolls because they lie and wait under the bridge. So we had a situation for one of our clients and as a defense, we brought the security for cost application against this plaintiff because the plaintiff was an empty shell with only some patent rights that it was trying to enforce. And um, our courts recognized the problem and we had a su successful hearing and a successful outcome for our client and significant security for cost order was ordered. And we would hope that um, this type of order would in future uh, discourage uh, plaintiffs from attempting to enforce patents which might not be either valid or actually enforced uh, or infringed. The, the second um, area that I want to concentrate on is urgent applications. We had a number of urgent court applications to enforce patent rights and um, a number of valuable lessons were learned during those. Um, we applied for 
interim interdicts, we had two applications for our client Bayer um, regarding the products Zeralta. It is an anticoagulant, so it is used to, to uh, where some thinning of the blood is required. Um, the major product that people might know in this class is Wafrin. It's been on the market for many years, and this is a similar product um, or in similar class uh, to Wafrin. And um, especially in COVID times, where it's realized that COVID to a large extent is it's not a pulmonary disease, it is a, a blood disease. Um, and um, the focus on the Zeralta and these anticoagulants um, uh, became real. Um, infringers started to enter the market, generic manufacturers, um, before the, while the patents were still enforced and are still enforced. And we had to launch these urgent interim interdict proceedings. We've had um, an order, successful order in the first matter, um, from start, the, from instituting the matter to uh, grant, getting the order was about four months. The second matter, um, we've had a hearing at the end of August, and we're currently waiting the judgment. But there are lessons, and they are generic that we we learned. Um, some of them was just old lessons that got reinforced, but very important out of a patent perspective is early preparations. Once you have a product and you realize it's successful and there's a risk of infringement and that you need to enforce your patent, early preparation on that patent litigation is, is of utmost importance. We need to make sure that the patents are in force and they are in the best um, state for enforcement proceedings. The defense we always get is one of invalidity. And if we've made early preparations, we've, we've made amendments where required, um, we are generally in a much better place to enforce the patent. Um, secondly, market intelligence, very important. To get early notice that there might be some infringement uh, comes from the market. People on the ground must keep their ears to, to the ground and give feedback into management of of what they are, are learning uh, on the ground. Thirdly, uh, unfortunately, our South African Health Products Regulatory Authority, SOPRA, has been um, less cooperative um, in uh, recent times than in the past, when they were still the MCC, Medicines Control Council. They regularly published uh, information on um, new pharmaceutical registrations, and no documents were available from them and one could quite easily ascertain what innovators and generics registered. Not so anymore. Unfortunately, SAPRA is, is, for some reason, not making those documents available on request, and that places a larger burden, burden on pharmaceutical companies to monitor market and to try and get information from different sources. On the design enforcement side, um, a debate that we've often had over the last couple of years is whether to enforce by way of a trial action uh, with oral evidence or through an application, which is mainly by on paper, by affidavit. And um, we've seen successes um, in both those procedures. Um, the big question always is, will there be a dispute of fact? However, on many designs, the, the disputes of fact would not be different whether you had a trial or an application. And it's generally a dispute between interpretation through experts, and that can be settled on the papers. As I said, the production of evidence between an action and an application is different. The evidence, normally expert evidence or infringement evidence, can as easily be provided through an application uh, than through an action. So often not a big difference there. However, the speed of an application is um, a lot better than an action, where it might take you uh, longer than a year or a year and a half to get a um, court date for a trial action. One could get an application into court within about six months. Applications are generally a lot more cost effective than actions uh, because you do not need to bring experts to court. You don't have your long um, 
consultations, expert summaries, and your hearing, which are, could be a couple of days, where hearing on our application might only be one day. So we have also seen that a big focus in these um, litigations, design litigations, is on the, the definitive and explanatory statements of the design registrations. And for those people registering designs, I think a lot of focus should go into those definitive and explanatory statements. And if there is important features of the design that can be identified, they should be identified upfront and because it makes our lives a lot easier when it gets to enforcement um, and we don't need to put all of those e evidence through an expert, we can rely then on the registered documents. Lastly, um, just for interest, an example of a recent matter where we acted for Maxi against a um, infringer on um, what we call a nudge bar it's at the front of a vehicle and also a sports bar at the back of a vehicle. And these type of designs, products, nudge bars, sports bars, there are many of those. They are common uh, items that are featured on many vehicles and have been uh, featured on many vehicles for many a year. But in this case, I think the, the important point is that even in something as simple as a match bar or a sports bar. With a proper registration, one can protect some unique features. In this case, the hoops are relatively standard, but what is different are angles, lengths of, um, of pieces. And then, for example, in this one, the two cross members, which are oval shaped and in forms type of louver arrangement on the match bar as well as the sports bar. And we sued for design infringement on these two products. Very similar hoop shapes, or the hoop shapes are identical because the designs conform to the body of the vehicle. And it had, although these cross members were not oval, they were round, um, they give exactly the same visual effect. And a consumer viewing um, the design on one vehicle and then the infringing product would probably not see any difference and um, will see them as the same. The courts agreed and we got successfully got interdicts against the infringer. So just the example where design registration can be quite powerful and one can have success um, in enforcement of designs. Thank you, Lita. That is just a short summary of, of some recent trends. Awesome. Thanks awesome. very Thanks. much, Danny. That was very insightful. Um, did I hear you correctly? Did you say that a matter was started and concluded in four months? I heard something about four months. Yeah, so um, on those urgent interim interdicts, we, we, we got orders within four months. Well, well done, South African courts, and well done to you and your team. Four months is not something you hear often of, um, so it looks like the innovation is working efficiently in South Africa. I just have a question. I'm curious. Do you think we can expect the courts to run remotely um, even after COVID? We, you know, starting to get back to work more and more. Uh, people are get, getting vaccinated. Can we expect the virtual hearings to continue? I think the virtual hearings were very effective, um, especially in applications, but. On, uh, in trial matters, I think there is a lot of benefit to have uh, in-court hearing and in-court delivery of evidence. And I would imagine that um, in the long term, the courts on trials will probably prefer uh, in in-person trials. But the on the application side, I think it's been working so well and there is no real need for people to be present in court. So I think um, it's just speculation, but, but in my view, it's more likely that the trials will go back to live hearings than the applications. Okay, thanks for that, Dani. I just have one more question. Um, you touched on gathering market intelligence um, as part of, of, of preparation for um, launching court proceedings. 
um, as you know, evidence can be quite um, a tricky thing if you don't go about it the right way. What are some tips that can you share um, with our, our delegates on how to gather evidence that is likely to be acceptable um, at court and effective um, for one's case? And, and that's an important question, and that's why sometimes you can move matters quickly. Um, it's if you have the right evidence and you've done the preparations up front. Um, and for pharmaceutical clients, um, the reps are often out at doctors, at uh, pharmacists, uh, pharmacies, also at uh, wholesalers. And the rumors that they hear in the market, um, people talk, uh, doctors will convey messages they receive from other reps, from other companies. Companies try and keep things as quiet as possible, but inevitably um, the reps are incentivized and they want to be able to push product in volume quickly as soon as it comes to market. So inevitably say, they start to tell uh, some of the doctors, some of the pharmacists uh, what is coming. And it is that feedback that one needs as soon as possible. And any brochures, any pamphlets, um, trade talks, often on trade talks and on seminars, statements are made. And one gathers those and with to know when, where and how it was said and who heard it. And that is the type of thing that can go into an affidavit and generally um, is accepted. And it's not, not, not that big a problem. Okay. Thanks so much, Danny. I'm just going to check if we have any questions on our chat before I let you go. Not. Okay. That was the chance to ask him a question without a fee. So if you don't have any, thank you so much, Danny. Thank you. That was insightful uh, and practical. Now we will move on to our next item on our agenda. Um, the next speaker, just gathering my papers here, is Trad Lahong. Um, Trad is going to talk to us um, about uh, international perspectives on local questions in intellectual property law. I'm particularly looking forward to what he will have to say about the IP waiver, that term that we've been hearing so much about. Uh, Trad is the former registrar of patents at the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission and is the attaché to Africa for the European Patent Office. Trout provides intellectual property commercialization and innovation advice and has global experience and networks in the intellectual property and technology innovation space. He regularly advises across several industry sectors, including advisory on intellectual property, the African continental trade, uh, free trade area, technology transfer, including tech measure and acquisitions, IT procurement and data privacy or cyber security. Trad is a registered patent attorney and an admitted um, attorney at uh, the attorney, sorry, admitted attorney at the High Court of South Africa. He holds a diploma in mechanical engineering from the Tswane University of Technology and a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of South Africa. Trad, do the right thing. Over to you. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, just share my presentation. Fantastic, great. Okay, so I've been asked to share a um, uh, perspective on uh, international uh, IP and, and as far as uh, South Africa is concerned, uh, how, how does it impact us? Um, so I've been uh, in, in my uh, capacity as the former registrar of uh, patents and, and, and designs. Um, I've interacted a lot with the with international uh, forums, um, local uh, forums. Uh, so my perspective is basically the, the, the balance of the of the two. Um, and how how we've benefited or not benefited from some of these uh, interactions. Okay, my, okay, okay, thanks. So South Africa has been in the news uh, quite a lot, I think, uh, in the past year or two. Um, not so so much in the in a good sense. Uh, we've. Uh, We've been in the news for mostly all the wrong reasons. Um, you know, we have the issues about the, the copyright bill um, and uh, the protests that have been um, started around the copyright bill. Um, the US threatening to put us on their 
um, IP watch list uh, as a result. Uh, there's been the IP waiver, which has caused uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, discussion internationally uh, around uh, the issue of public health versus the patenting. Uh, South Africa became the first uh, country in the world to grant uh, a patent to an AI inventor. And uh, for many years, we've been talking, we've been hearing about reforms of uh, the, the, the uh, IP landscape in South Africa, um, particularly the, the patents bill. And, um, and uh, people are still waiting for, for these developments to, to happen. Firstly, let's start off with the IP waiver, because I think that is the discussion that is most prominent in, in at, at the moment as far as international uh, cooperation and relations are concerned with South Africa. Um, in 20, 2020, South Africa with India uh, submitted a proposal to the TRIPS, to the WTO, um, asking them essentially to waive patent rights. Um, as far as it relates to uh, isn't there's something wrong with my presentation it is it not visible i i can see it throughout it's coming it's coming through on my side um I you think that may just that. be an issue with uh, maybe some of the delegates, maybe their connection, but we can we can see it clearly. All right. Um, so yeah, so uh, the 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 waiver essentially uh, related to anything that was related to the prevention or treatment of COVID. Um, very broad in the sense that you know everything pretty much related to to COVID was uh, the the proposal asked for it to be waived. But uh, the issue of this waiver is actually not a new thing. It's actually um, something that has been going on for quite some time. Many, many years, there's been discussion over the role that patents play uh, versus the public health issues, public health considerations. And uh, at many forums uh, like the WTO, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, this issue of the public health uh, and the patents uh, system versus the public health has been discussion has been discussed at nauseam uh, without really finding a consensus on what would be the correct approach. So in actual fact, the, the so-called IP waiver um, actually came before, uh, interestingly enough, actually came before uh, COVID. Um, the discussions around this waiver actually started before COVID. COVID was just the thing that you know kicked it over the line to, to for it to become now a, a discussion at the World Trade Organization. And essentially, um, as I said, you know, there's been many revisions of this, but initially was to uh, ask that to waive all IP rights concerned with um, uh, COVID itself, so that and also related products and, and, and a lot of contention was around what is this related product some some would say just the patent some included the know-how techno transfer all of it was included in this uh, in this one catchphrase uh, related products and you will see that some countries support the waiver and some do not uh, some some support only part of the waiver uh, ex for example the us would support only patents related to COVID and nothing else um, some are broader, there was a patents and related knowledge. Um, so depending on the country position that is taken, there are uh, people who are for and against it. The, the, the later um, uh, revision uh, now speaks to a waiver of Article 28 of TRIPS, uh, which is the, the, the article that confers patent rights, um, and it's specifically restricted to that. And in our law, that uh, that uh, provision finds um, uh, its equivalent in Section 4051, and that's to grant the patent the patentee the rights to make, use, exercise, dispose of, offer to dispose of, or import the invention in the in the in the republic. So that that's the current proposal that has been discussed, and there are certain counter again there are certain counter proposals that have been made by other countries. 
But essentially now we've gone from waiving all IP rights to now a limited form of a waiver uh, that asks for a waiver of the uh, Article 26, 28 of TRIPS. Now, the question would be, is the waiver good for South Africa or is it a particularly bad thing? Well, it, the answer to that would be yes and no. In, 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 a, in a good sense is that since 2020, when we had the, the waiver, um, there's been a lot of pressure on developed countries to support um, developing and least developing countries, not only from a financial perspective, not only from donating vaccines, but also to support initiatives related to technology transfer. Now, the waiver of, of IP rights, uh, in, in a sense, is not enough for uh, for us to catch up and for us to be able to develop our own pharmaceutical industry, for us to be able, for us to, be able to develop our own vaccines, our own PPEs and so forth. Uh, a large part of, of what's also required is this technology transfer and knowledge transfer. And as a result, there's been a number of initiatives in, in this direction. Um, the, the EU is providing a fund of 1 billion to Africa to create capacity in vaccine development. Uh, the EU uh, NEPAD is developing regional hubs that will manufacture different types of vaccines, PPEs, diagnostics, treatments and so forth related to not only vac uh, COVID vaccines, but other vaccines as well. Um, things to treat things like malaria, TB and so forth. Um, so <clears throat> these regional hubs are going to be placed as strategic regions throughout Africa. Uh, Espen and J&J have signed an agreement to manufacture uh, COVID vaccines for Africa. Uh, Pertuk Shun is backing a vaccine uh, a candidate for, for COVID. Uh, BioVac has signed a, a, uh, an agreement with a US-based company, uh, Immuno, uh, Immunity Bio, uh, in terms of which, again, there's, a, there's an agreement to manufacture these vaccines. On a negative side, um, the the waiver, as I said, it's not enough. You know, you can waive the IP rights, fine, and the patents might not be granted, but you still need the technology transfer. You still need the non, non knowledge and skills transfer for us to be able to manufacture vaccines. Um, on the continent, in the last I checked, I think there's only about three. Um, uh, WHO certified vaccine manufacturers in the entire continent. I think one is in Tunisia, um, the other one might be in Morocco, somewhere around there. Um, but there's very, there, it clearly shows that we don't have you know, sufficient capacity in Africa to be even vaccine manufacturers. So waiving IP rights on its own is not going to solve that problem. The other negative is that obviously, um, you know, the credibility of our IP system in, in South Africa is all is an all time low. Uh, there's a lot of confidence lost in South Africa. Uh, South Africa previously was viewed as champion um, of, of, of the developing countries, develop uh, least developing countries, championing the rights of uh, these countries at international forum for positive outcomes. And, and that perception has been tainted by this waiver as it's seen as uh, nothing more than um, an attempt to undermine uh, other economies. Uh, in addition to all the other things that I've mentioned, the copyright bill, the, the delay of the implementation of the patent legislation, um, the grant of the, uh, the uh, patent to an AI inventors, all of these things have a knock on effect and, and, it, and it's really uh, put our credibility at a, at, a low, at a low point. And of course, while, while the, pres the, 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 the discussions are ongoing around the, the waiver, it delays the reforms that are desperately needed as far as patents are concerned. Now, one of the reasons why we have this conundrum is if you look at our legislation, it is outdated. Uh, many of these legislations uh, were in the 1970s, the 90s, and it's really failed to keep up with developments internationally and to implement international best practice. And we find this across all our legislations, not just in patents. 
And also, never mind the fact that it's old legislation, but there also hasn't been many uh, updates of our legislation as the world has moved on from an IP perspective. Now, the IP policy was meant to be this bridge between our outdated legislation and, and international uh, international IP systems. And it's it was seen as in, in many ways as a step in the right direction to ensuring that our legislation is kept up to date. And also, uh, we talk a lot about a knowledge economy. We want to transform South Africa from a, a resource-based economy to a knowledge-based economy. Many of the interventions are driven towards transforming South Africa into a knowledge economy. A lot of them are related to the patent system, of course, as a knowledge driver, um, introducing substantive examination, oppositions, defining a patentability criteria, uh, to providing clarity around patentability criteria, disclosure requirements, parallel importation, exceptions and limitations, uh, compulsory licensing, changing the compulsory licensing system, and also dealing with issues around IP and competition law. Now, why are these, ne these uh, reforms necessary? Well, if you look at our patent register, um, and Donnie mentioned something earlier which was critical around ensuring that the patent that is granted if there has been amended amendments made elsewhere to make sure that these amendments are then carried forward into south african applications many of our applications that are on our register uh, do not follow that normally they're filed uh, they filed at pct national phase and they get they proceed to grant in their unamended form although there has been amendments that have been made elsewhere uh, many examining jurisdictions the other challenge that we see now, um, and it's not just South Africa, is that because of the Chinese government providing incentives to inventors to get granted patents, uh, many countries are now becoming dumping, uh, dumping grounds for these Chinese patents. Now, on average, China files about 1.2 million uh, patent, uh, PCT, uh, patent applications in China. Uh, if you add utility models to that, you get about almost 3 million applications. Now, out of these 3 million applications, 60, uh, around 68,000 have come proceeded to PCT applications. So it just goes to show the number of quality that has been reduced from essentially 3 million applications to only 68%, 68,000 uh, that are deemed good enough to be at PCT level. And then a lot of these. Uh, that are not within the PCT system are actually finding out their way into South Africa um, because of these incentives to get uh, granted patents. And again, it leads to the next point, which is uh, procedural abu uh, uh, abuses. You know, we've seen that the system has been used to expedite grant of, of, of patent applications. And, and because of that, uh, you know, we are seeing a lot of dumping of happening. We are seeing a lot of uh, shortcuts being taken. And um, we've seen again this example with the first uh, patent application being granted to an AI machine, um, even though legally in South Africa, uh, South African law only recognizes a natural person a as a, and a juristic person as being capable of acquiring rights. We now have an AI inventor in South Africa that's been granted a patent. So these reforms are very much necessary um, to make sure that our system remains robust and again that, that we can restore some credibility to the system. And why? what are the measures that have been introduced? Obviously the introduction of substantive search and examination to ensure that only um, patents that are worthy are granted. Um, those that meet our law, or the requirements of our law and practice are, are granted. Uh, providing greater clarity around pharma biotech completer implemented inv inventions often we assume that you know uh, the, we will take the european approach in certain respects but we need that clarity in our law to be provided and that clarity can be provided through patent examination guidelines there's other uh, posi uh, um, uh, measures to ensure that the public is also an active participant in the uh, in the patent grant process through opposition and third party procedures to make sure that again to ensure that the quality of the patents that are on our register are is is of the highest quality and that only patents that are worthy are granted and there are other reforms relate to taking advantage of uh, 
trips flexibilities around, especially around pharmaceutical products, uh, compulsory licensing, and uh, the introduction of an administrative rather than a judicial process for granting compulsory licenses. There are also reforms that are geared towards making the system more inclusive um, to recognizing incremental innovations through utility models. And if you see the development of many countries, uh, developed countries, China, Japan, Korea, the US, all of the major economies, they all started having this utility model system to increase the number of local participants in the patent system. Over time, um, increasing the number of innovations that are coming from the country and developing their knowledge through that. So other through technology in licensing, in many instances, copying what other people have done, but all of the major economies in the world have had at one point or another, either in licensed technology or copied from others in order to advance their technologies. So the, the utility model is brought in for particularly that, that, that reason and also to in, in incentivize individual SMMEs and invent, individual inventors to participate in the system by making the system more accessible to them and providing other opportunities. And again, uh, growing the, the, the patent profession. And why is this all important? And where does the linkage between the patent system uh, come in? Because uh, there's a study that was done by the Re European Patent Office and by WIPO that found that um, 80 percent of the new world's new knowledge is only found in patent documents uh, and 20 percent is found elsewhere so scientific journals publications and so forth only contains 20 percent of the world's new knowledge and um, and and the important point to that is that there's approximately 150 million patent documents worldwide 90 percent of these have either been re withdrawn refused um, expired and as I said, many countries have taken advantage of this very fact to be able to increase their knowledge, their skills, um, use the patent system as a as a as a vehicle for 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 information, and they've developed on this knowledge, um, not trying to reinvent the wheel. And it's an opportunity for us not to try and reinvent reinvent the wheel, but to leapfrog and, and uh, to using the patent system to leapfrog and grow our skills base uh, in South Africa and grow this the skills base of our uh, entrepreneurs and uh, inventors in this amazing. And lastly, um, to grow the profession. Uh, if we don't have local innovators, we don't have local entrepreneurs, we don't achieve the knowledge economy. And in the end, we'll be fighting over the crumbs over a very small pie. So, all of us have to collectively um, engage and, and see how we ensure that do our part ensuring that we grow the patent system in South Africa despite the many challenges and ensure that we all have a future in the patent system and that is my presentation thank you thanks thank so much Todd. that was very insightful um, and very informative I like how you kind of brought what's happening internationally locally um, and you highlighted the impact of that and the importance of that. Um, I've got uh, uh, questions for you in the chat. Um, I'll perhaps start with uh, this one. Um, if patent rights are waived, um, can we then question manufacturers who channel the bulk of their products to those jurisdictions where they have patent protection? Sorry, say that again. If the patent rights are waived, um, are we able to question manufacturers who channel the bulk of their products to those jurisdictions where they have secured patent protection? Yeah, so the waiver, how it's supposed to operate is that it's supposed to be an international waiver. So it's not supposed to be an, an, a, a local waiver of patent rights. So if we waive patent rights uh, in terms of section Article 28, um, then then um, it would apply to all uh, members of, of the WTO. The challenge still lies is that it has to be nationalized. So even though it's worked at the international level, you still have to amend our, our laws to be able to be in line with that, the, the, the waiver. And of course, you know, there may be delay tactics. 
by some people who not support the waiver to to amend the laws accordingly and so that they can benefit from the from the the, the they can continue to to benefit from their patents so you will definitely see uh, those kinds of scenarios taking place um, thanks. Thanks for that, Trod. Um, we've got a comment from Maureen. Very interesting so far. Do you think that the waiver will affect future innovation and dissuade inventors? Um, not necessarily. I, I, I don't think so. I mean, there's always been this argument that, you know, if we don't have um, strong patent rights, um, you know, there's no innovation or there's, this is a disincentive for, for people to invent. Um, and as 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 much as patents uh, encourage uh, knowledge transfer and, and and inventorship, ultimately the 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 reason why we all invent is because of a human need. Um, we we invent because we are trying to solve problems. Uh, we're trying to come up with solutions. Uh, the patent system is there as an incentive, but it doesn't uh, take away from the fact that. We we have we encounter problems all the time, and we need to come up with solutions for the for those times. You know, we want to do things faster. We want to get mm. there quicker. We want to be more efficient. Um, that is why we invent. That is the ultimate reason why we invent. The patent system is there really to be provide the incentives, and whether or not people will be disincentivized, I, I'm I'm not too sure. I don't think that there's a the strongest uh, connection between. The incentive on the one hand that the patent system uh, provides and to okay. cure a basic human need. OK, thanks for that, Trot. I think I can squeeze in one more from Lindy. Can you please explain TRIPS to a five year old? And also, does it only apply to COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing or can it be applied to other fields? Yeah, TRIPS means trade related related aspects of intellectual property rights. So it's the governing trade and intellectual property rights um, legislation, if I call international uh, legislation. You have various legislations, local legislations that uh, international and international and local legislation that govern IP rights. Uh, the TRIPS legislation is really a governing framework for countries to respect IP rights in, in trade. OK, and it applies to all forms of IP, just for clarity. It applies to all forms of IP, yes. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Trod. That was informative. Um, it was good, and I love that it was for the South African audience. Um, Thank you. For the continent's audience, really. Um, and thanks for highlighting those interesting stats. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of Crema 2021. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, before you hurry off, please, please take a moment and complete our survey. I believe our team will post the link on the chat. Um, we do want to hear your feedback. What do you think worked? What didn't work? What can we do um, to improve Kramer going forward? Do you want to see us virtually or do you want to see us in a physical room where we can be all together? Um, so please um, uh, complete that uh, survey link for us. I also believe a thank you mailer will be going out um, with the link to today's session. Um, please remember as well that sessions from day one, day two and day three will also be available um, on our website. Before um, we drop off, I would like to say thank you, thank you, thank you to our guest speakers um, for all three days. They did an amazing job of compiling um, good and, and really um, insightful information uh, for Crema. Thanks uh, to them, first of all, accepting the invitation to, to be on this platform, um, as well as preparing those talks for us, which we can revisit um, on our website, as I mentioned, going forward. I also want to thank our marketing team. You guys have been amazing and dynamic, putting up with nervous lawyers, um, trying to put presentations together. Thank you so much. Um, thanks also to our PR team, WePR, um, for pumping this up on the socials. Um, thank you also to Flash Forward, our tech uh, partners who have made this possible. I think it, it has run quite well despite load shedding. Thank you so very much. And the last and final thank you to you, our audience. You guys have been awesome. Thank you for your participation, your comments, um, and just really weighing in in all of these topics, uh, making it as interactive as possible. Albeit you, I couldn't hear your voices, at least I could read your comments um, and your questions, um, which were handled by our guest speakers. Well, that is it. Um, this is the end. 
Um, thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, please, please keep safe, sanitize, wear your mask, social distance, um, and uh, keep well, everybody. Thank you so much. Until next time. Cheers.